I don't know if I even need a mic. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm next on the agenda. As you might have heard from the previous discussion, I had a chance to work on three seminal video game machines. The first was the Atari 2600. The people up here were talking about that. Uh, the second was the Atari computer. I've given a talk about that here before. Um, I'll talk about that again next year when I've done some new engineering on it. And I worked at Atari for testing. I worked at Atari, a little bit about that. So in 1975, I have a medical electronics master's degree from Berkeley, and I'm working in medical electronics. And that summer, 1975, I'm walking down the street inside Disneyland in Anaheim, California, and I hear funny, name, funny things off on the side. And I walk in, and it's an arcade there. Have any of you been to Disneyland in Anaheim before? You have a clue. Good. Right, so here is the first Atari video game I'd ever seen, which was Tank. My brother and I, he was, I was 24 at the time, he was 12, wasted a fair number of quarters playing Tank. He beat me regularly. That fall, I'm doing medical research and they run out of money because they have too many patients in the study that I'm working on who don't have health insurance and they ate up all the budget. So I was informed that I'm losing my job. Now meantime, I had been studying microprocessors. I was reading Byte magazine when it first came out. And I read about this Atari, I'm sorry, this um, IEEE conference called Westcon, Western Electronics Show and Convention. It used to alternate between the Los Angeles area and the San Francisco area every year. And I read about this new microprocessor called the 6502. And I thought, that looks pretty interesting. So I went there with my own money and I bought the processor in a jewel case for $25. At that time in history, a $25 price for a microprocessor was astonishing. The onesie price for an Intel 8080 was $100. And this is not current dollars, this is $1975. In 1975, you could buy a nice house in the Santa Clara Valley for $25,000. And you can't buy a nice house there for less than a million right now. There's been this inflation thing going on. But anyway, I went to Westcon and I bought myself a 6502. And when I lost my job, one of the two job interviews I got was with Atari. I chose the Atari. I was interested in the Atari job because they were going to teach me things I didn't already know how to do, like design custom chips. I passed the interviews because I didn't know that they had also chosen the 6502. And I hadn't yet met Wozniak, who had also chosen the 6502 to build the Apple I for himself. But I went for the technical interview around Thanksgiving of 1975, and I passed the technical interview, and then on the way out of the technical interview, we're passing through the lobby at Atari, and they have tank games with the coin slots bypassed. And I realized that they're about to test me as a game player. Fortunately, I'd waste a lot of money on learning tank that summer, so I passed the test. And they hired me on the spot, basically. I started the day after Christmas, the week after Christmas. And so I spent most of two years working at Atari, designing the hardware and the software for what became the home version of the tank game, Combat. And I brought it home for Christmas, 1977, and my brother still beat me at my own game. <laughs> now, enough of that aside. So, this was my third system. Have any of you here read a book called The Mythical Man Month? Yes! <laughs> well done. Okay, there's a chapter in there called The Second System Effect. The Atari computer was our second system. This was the third. So, 
I worked at Atari for a while, um, changed hands. They brought in a guy named Ray Kassar, who was from the fabric business. He took engineering aside in February of 1979, and he said, we're going to sell computers to women. How are we going to do that? We're going to put them in designer colors. Within two months, all of the women who worked in engineering, and there are many good ones, they all left. <laughs> and my boss decided to leave Atari at that point. And at that point, I thought, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but I believe in quality. And I knew that we were supporting production in the Santa Clara Valley. And I stuck around until all the production test software that production was going to use was perfect and the yields were going to be good on the Atari computer. And then I left. So I left, did other things. J Miner went off and did uh, implanted um, pacemaker chips back when those were brand new. But a couple of years later, Larry Kaplan, who had been one of the founders of Activision and gotten bored, was starting to talk to people about yet another game machine in 19, mid-1982. And he talked to his investors. And this was a time when venture capital was starting to become popular in the Santa Clara Valley. And a lot of people thought, hey, I could do this too. And so they formed this company that became High Toro and then became Amiga. J Miner called me up in October of 1982 and he said, you know, we could do this again. This is the story. What? Oh, wrong direction? I see. Wrong button. Here's what I want to talk about and I will move through it quickly, but I'll stop for questions. We have, what, 47 minutes, something like that, before I'll have to get out of here for the next speaker. But I'll do my best to explain this. Unfortunately, I didn't spend the time getting one of these things to work, but it'd be nice to, for you to be able to enjoy it in person. So I'll talk a little bit about who was involved here and how we came into it, and then get into what we attempt to do accomplish. This is, amongst other things, a story of the connections between the market, what are they asking for, and how the technical community responds with products. So is there anything in particular that you guys want to hear about before I move into this? Anything you want to cut? All right, early history. Um, I had worked for Jay on three machines, the Atari games machine, the Atari computer, and I, was, I came back to work on this. Ron Nicholson did not work at Atari, but he did work on custom chips that were used by Apple, one of which was used in the original Macintosh. And Jay knew all of us, so we got together and we were apprenticed to Jay from 1982 through when they failed to renew my contract just a year later. And Ron stuck around, he was a blue badge, a little bit longer. We are co-inventors with Jay Miner on those four patents. Anyway, at some point when I've got my own website up, this presentation will be there and you can read them off of that or you can just go to web search and look for my patents. But there you are, all right? Yeah, Ron had worked and he had, Steve Jobs actually introduced Ron Nicholson to Jay Miner back when. All right, my history, I explained that story, so I'll keep moving. All right, here is a block diagram of what the 2600 looked like inside. This is quoted out of the standard programming manual. You'll recognize it, right? It has one custom chip in it for video and audio, a general purpose chip for RAM, I.O. and timer, the processor itself, and a plug-in cartridge. There is no resonant code at all in the system. Our second system, where of course we were trying to decide whether this is just the best possible game we could come up with, or a personal computer, or both, we wound up with a system that looked like this. It had a faster version of the same processor, 
uh, three custom chips, one that manipulated memory, one that handled video out, and one that handled non-video out, uh, the CTIA. And its story I've told here before, and next year I'm going to come back with the book I'm writing about it, but not today. Third one, this here is, I made a copy out of my last Atari um, engineering manual where we said, okay, suppose, I had friends in CoinUp too, I said, suppose I was going to take these ideas and take them even farther. I would build a machine with a 16-bit processor, a lot of two-ported memory, and some custom chips to handle a lot of different kinds of I.O. So this is, foreshad this is from mid-1979, foreshadowing what we would do in the Amiga three years later. So, what did I learn from Atari? First is, the programmers, the guys who were here just before me, they're really smart. They're a whole lot smarter than we expected them to be. We built a system, that was a good thing. We built a system that was focused and cheap. All of our competition was looking at memory map systems, and we thought, with a fast enough processor, we can do line-oriented stuff. We did it, again, to be cheap, and not to um, do what we did inadvertently, which is to put the video in the hands of the programmers. And they just ran away with it. Um, like I say during the previous talk, we thought our customers, this would be a processor that would be, a system that would be obsolete in two or three years, that people might buy three or four game cartridges a piece. They were buying a dozen a piece. When that happens, your customers own you, and we didn't realize that. But I did learn that offloading the central processor would allow a lot more things to happen and presumably result in a better end user experience. I am thinking about, what if I was a customer? What do I want? And we thought then, we weren't afraid of Activision yet, that we should design a system that was open enough so that we could attract other game developers. I didn't have conversations with Atari Marketing who thought, oh, that's where all the money is. But I digress. So here's how we got to this one. In the environment, okay, so this is 1982. The Atari VCS is selling very, very well. It wound up selling at least 30 million units. In fact, of those of you where they've re-engineered it, there are these things called flashbacks. I bought a flashback two 10 years ago. They sold almost a million flashbacks. Um, the Apple II was prosperous, the IBM PCXC was, had just been in, introduced in the fall that year. 64K bytes of RAM was still over $100 in 1982 dollars. And like I said, there's been a whole lot of inflation since then. Today, we're talking well over $1,000 to buy 64K bytes of RAM. The geometries had shrunk, it used to be 10 micron for a transistor. Today it's less than 20 nanometers, so we're talking vastly smaller things. These were down to four micron and MOS, but it was hand laid out on Ruby lit. And the common biggest packages you could buy were 40 pin, maybe 48 under special circumstances. That's what we were designing against. So this is detail on what you could buy at the time. So this is looking at the Macintosh when it finally came out in 1984 versus the Amiga 1000 when it finally came out in 1985, introduced, right? So different processors between four and eight bit buses. Um, there was no exposed bus in the Commodore 64, but it sold well. It had a serial bus outside. It was quite slow. Um, the video started with what we would today call very low resolution. 
and the Amiga had resolution that pushed the limits of the displays that you could buy, either monitors or TVs. And what we'll talk about as we get into it is it had much more ability to animate than the older systems did. Um, pressed for time, any questions about these? Yeah. My family had an Apple II way back in mm -hmm. 78 or 79. I, I, I seem to remember maybe this is emerging older. Wasn't there an 80, an 80 character set that you could convert? Like, you could buy a plug-in card that did 80 characters. And it would have to drive a monitor that could handle 80 characters because you could not put 80 characters on a commercial television. They can't handle it. You didn't have a monitor. Right, exactly. Okay. Right, fair enough. So our market goal, what are we trying to build this for? Well, this is 1982. The guy who was the new president of this company, he was badge number one, I was badge number three. He had been a former marketing VP at Tonka Toys, and he's thinking about entertainment and toys, not about technology per se. And his goal was to bring entertainment stories from movies and TV networks into your living room which is what video games did in general. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but for the last year that I have numbers for, which is 2014, the video game console and game market grossed $74 billion US. In the same year, the commercial music business, Grammys, and the commercial movie business, the Oscars, those combined businesses were smaller than the combined video games business. It's that big. And what I think is winning is that if you sit down and watch television, you're watching somebody else's story. And if you sit down and listen to the music, you're listening to somebody else's composition. If you sit down in front of a video game, the story is generated by you and the other player, even if it's a mob. So it's something that hasn't been written before. So, we wanted a machine that could render cartoons, interactive games, interactive stories, in real time. We joked about what it would take to animate a game full of Smurfs. So, but we wanted to animate them fast enough to keep up with what kids who are used to watching on home television sets, watching real hand animated cartoons, but animate them in real time. So, we, yes sir? Just out of curiosity, how many frames a second was that? Well, TVs will display 60, but they're interlaced, so 30 frames per second. Right, but I mean, a Smurfs cartoon would have been like, what, 16 or something? Well, the action happens slower, but no, that's, as we'll talk about, the Amiga hardware can clear one bit plane in a 60th of a second. It can touch all the hardware that fast. And this is a 1985 design. Nothing close to what you can buy now. Um, but Jay, anticipating a needed pivot, he wanted to be able to design a personal computer out of it as well as a game machine. And so we merged what we knew from the hardware and software worlds into this new architecture. Um, here we are. By the way, the reason for the um, PowerPoint and the IEEE Consumer Electronics Society, I'm what they call a distinguished lecturer. They fly me all over the planet and they reimburse me for doing stuff like this. Anyway, um, what we were stuck with in 1983, interlaced NTS national television standards. <coughs> sync and flexibility to Genlock. We wanted this machine to be able to interact with video from other sources and mix it all together. It turned out later, looking ahead, the biggest market for Amiga computers that went on for two decades after we introduced it was it was used in TV production where they would photograph the weather person in front of a green screen and they would digitally mix it with a digitally generated map. This happened long after Amiga went belly up in the market. It was that powerful. 
Um, we wanted, DMA means direct memory access. So we wanted to offload the processor to result in a better end user experience, better sound and better graphics than could be done by software alone. In fact, we defined a coprocessor that followed the beam vertically and horizontally, and you could program it to wait for this particular place on the screen and change the hardware. We put in a bit blitter, which I'll talk about more with pictures, that could um, splice, let's say, a background of a Smurf into a, a Smurf foreground object into a background. It could do area fill, line draw, generate what we now call, um, you know, how many polygons can it generate? It could generate them under hardware control. It could do flexibility where it could draw things and put them either in front of the background or behind the background, like if you're doing something and then there's holes, logical holes in it. Um, it did hold and modify for color compression. I have some illustrations about what that looks like. It did a four-channel sampled audio synthesis engine. The older stuff had special purpose hardware. You could modify it a little bit to make tank sounds or jet plane sounds or whatnot. This kid thing could digitize anything to 8-bit and A to D resolution and play back 4,000 byte images. It could. One of the demonstrations we did is we had the dog bark. Jay had a dog. So we had a dog bark image and then we hooked it up to a keyboard and if you hit a low note you would, you would get a wolf sound and if you hit it way up here you'd get a yip sound and down in between you could play four chord dog barking. <laughs> Um, we did a configurable interrupt system based on the video time, so again, the processor could come out and do stuff and go hide. Those are the innovations, and I know that these seem a little bit dry to you. I wish I set up the audio <laughs> the, uh, demonstration. It's set up. It's plugged in. Oh, that? I'll make it work. Um, I need the powers in there, and the mice is in there. We might be able to get that to happen, but let's move through this a little faster. So, as I said, we were constraints. We used 5 micron CMOS, we get 40 pin diffs, and we did this all by hand, because they didn't have hardware checking. So we did a chip that did address generation, we did a chip that drove video, and we did a chip that did non-video I.O. like diskette, serial port DMA, four channel audio. I'm gonna move through some of these quickly. I hope that she's faster. So, we got the best CPU that we could afford at the time. This is now mid 80s. This was a 24 bit address, 16 bit data machine. This is the same one they used in the Macintosh. Um, we did planar bit format to fit bitmaps in limited memory. So, instead of having a piece of memory that per pixel, you had one bit in something larger that was one bit deep for a given plane. And you can have one plane, two planes, four planes. Um, if you had four planes, that means you're mapping to 16 different colors for any given space. What the things like the Amiga did was they had a palette register that could be selected by what the bit planes told it. So, if you can imagine RGB in modern stuff, or in the old days, you would have luminance, chroma, and saturation on old analog televisions. Did anyone remember old analog televisions? Those are the three controls at the bottom you had. So the Amiga could generate either 12 bits for those three controls, or it could generate three bits for Sorry, three numbers for red, green, and blue. You know, 16-bit values for each. That's what we had at the time. Um, we did color compression because you could program it with a fifth bit, fifth bit plane, and if the bit was on, you could hold two of the values and slowly modify the third one so you could wash out color. I have some pictures here to share with what that might look like. Yeah. 
Socializing and not <coughs> setting up the demos. All right. This goes, there's a 23 pin connector, and that is your component now. Right. That's correct, it isn't power, but we got. All right, forgive me for the technical interruption. This. Plugged in there, and I plugged this. <coughs> All right, where were we? So it did bit blitting. Has anyone ever heard of the term <coughs> bit blitting before? Some of you have. Um, if it's software driven, imagine a bit plane of any resolution, and let's suppose I want to draw a Smurf or any object, and I've got the drawn background. Well, what I have to do is I need three bits of information. I need what the background looks like, I need what the new foreground object is going to look like, and I need what amounts to a cookie cutter. So I know where the foreground thing fits and what is left around it. So you have to do this three-bit operation on every single pixel to do the splice in. What we did in this machine is we did that driven in hardware rather than the software. We also, in the previous talk, they talked about having two complex moving objects. The, uh, our computer had uh, four complex moving objects. This thing had eight complex moving objects and they were all reusable, which means that you could use it somewhere and then on another horizontal scan line, put it anywhere else. And then after it was done, put a new one anywhere else. So from a hardware standpoint, this is getting complicated. We had this chip, Agnes, what we called it, and I don't know why we called it with a U rather than an E, um, did DMA means direct memory access. That means it's sharing access to memory in the bus with the main processor. It refreshed the DRAM. Does anyone know what DRAM is? Some of you do. Basically, it's a whole lot more memory if you just remember things in little tiny capacitors rather than in feedback circuits. That's called static RAM, right? So it refreshed that so memory wouldn't evaporate. <coughs> it would run the coprocessors that follow the beam down the screen. It would do the bit blitters. I could take three inputs and make one output, and they could be in different places. It did took bit playing from memory in you know one bit deep all the way up to six bits deep, and put it to video. It took sprite data to the TV. It did diskette data to and from diskette trying to make it fast enough. People complained about how slow the Commodore 64 and the Atari computer were to get to and from diskette data, so we built much faster I.O. into it. And it did all that audio stuff, which I'll talk about. So, this may work. If it does, it'd be great. And if it doesn't, well, I'm sorry. Let me, while we're at it, grab. The games. Where'd the games go? Come on. There they are. Games. <laughs> hey, Joe. Yeah. I should uh, use the mic so the camera can get audio. I should stay still so that the camera can get me. No, no, the camera is plugged into the soundboard, so it's not getting your audio unless you're talking to the microphone. Thank you. I should know this. All right, so we built the processor that followed the, the, the screen and it could do three things. It could wait for a particular place on the screen. It could, when it got there, fetch anything out of memory and shove it into anywhere in the hardware, which could 
change pointers, start and stop the glitter, change sound, anything you wanted to imagine in those chips. And it could do some simple conditional logic. So, as an example then, this is a system block diagram, and the coprocessor, which is built into here, when it's invoked, could change colors here, do anything in here, or anything in here at beam-specific times. So, a little bit more about the bitmap hardware. It was only two resolutions, 320 or 640 across horizontally. Now, you can't do better than 320 on a TV. And if you're close to that, you might get color aliasing. But if you're driving a monitor, which in 1982, the monitor business was starting to come into existence. In 1977, when we did the game machine, there was no monitor business. In 1979, when the computer came out, there was hardly any monitor business. But IBM introduced the PC in 1982, and that provoked the generation of the monitor business. And so we had new things that we might drive. So we could drive 640 pixels across, which they now call VGA. Um, and it could do either non-interlaced or interlaced. So is it, is it uh, there's a resolution that that corresponds to now. It was bit plan oriented, as I talked about. So I could say, suppose I wanted just monochrome. Well, I only need one set of bits to do that. If I'm designing a game machine, and I only have enough money to buy 64K of RAM, because I'm trying to hit cost targets, I can do a whole lot if I'm willing to adjust my audio down to one or two bits worth. Um, like I say, it had power registers, so I have something that determines the shape of the display and then something that determines its color separately. As an aside, way back in 1977, one of the things I invented and didn't patent was using the pallet registers for um, burn-in. It turns out when we were developing this thing back in 1976 and you left it alone, it would have the same pattern. And what tended to happen to coin-op video games is that they burn in a pattern on the screen if you left them alone a long time. And what we said was, well, okay, if somebody's, if the game is timed out, let's slowly change all the palette registers so that each palette register goes through the same long cycle but on a different, starting in a different place. I have a couple copies of the Consumer Reports magazine from November of 1977 that my mother saved for me where consumer electronics, uh, sorry, um, not consumer electronics, um, consumer reports thought it was the best game because it didn't ruin your TV if you left it alone. <laughs> so that's a use of the pallet register concept. Um, we also designed this thing so that it could scroll smoothly both in horizontal and vertical. They were talking in the previous one about the ability to make much larger vertical spaces appear, and this could do that easily. So, this is a little bit of arithmetic about what we could display with a small memory machine. Let's suppose we're only going for 320 by 240, and we've got one bit plane. We can do that in under 10,000 bytes. Um, if we want a color, we need three bit planes, and so it costs us you know, 29,000 bytes to display the whole screen. And if we were building a, a very small footprint, pure video game console, and we only put 32K bytes into it, we've already used up most of it. I mean, that means all the rest of the stuff in the system has to run off of 32K. Um, where's the game gonna go, right? So a split system with three planes for background and three for foreground, that would be twice that again. Now we originally shipped a product with 128K and that's using up nearly half of it. Um, if we wanted to do high resolution, 
just just one bit deep was going to eat up 38,000 bytes of memory. So you can see from this slide that the more graphics you pull up, you use up memory really quick. Um, as I say, if we did a 640 by 480 display, in the original ship machine, again, we would use up most of the memory available. Now, all you guys have in your pockets mobile phones that have, you know, 32 gigabytes in them. We didn't have that then. So, bit splitter. I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit in the next slides. I talked about the idea that you need three bits of information. What's the background look like? What's the foreground thing going to look like? And what's the outline of it? So, basically, we did this in hardware. I'm going to move a little faster. So, this is what the logic looked like. I could keep track of three different sources of information and then have something to determine where it went, which might be a different place and it might not. The cost of building a system in pieces is that you need memory for the inputs and the outputs separately, but the, the other advantage is, suppose I'm drawing images in background, I don't have to keep around the old image is to splice back in. Suppose I've moved this Smurf, right? Well, one of the things I might want to do first is, is erase by rewriting the old background before I generate the new Smurf. You follow that? You, have, you double the amount of operations you have to do if you want to erase what you're doing and before you write the new one. And you imagine how terrible the gameplay would be if the little pieces of the Smurf just kept filling up the whole screen as it moved around? That would be not a good end user experience. So this is what the logic looked like, and this is sort of what it looked like. Imagine I had on the top, um, you know, four color tank sprite, and below it I have the outline for it, and below it I have some random four color background. What happens when you feed those three operands into the blitter? where you're to choosing, the output is either one and two, if they're both on, or three and not two, otherwise, it's just a simple splitter. That's what the composite Im image looks like. Does that make sense? Now, everybody designing video game hardware has to do stuff like this. With the PlayStation 3, it's much more general. They have a processor in it called a cell and it has one general purpose processor running some Linux variant, and it has eight rendering engines, DSPs, all of which are doing stuff like this. Um, that's why it takes so long to develop those games now as somebody's doing all those pieces. Okay, an example of the use case. You might want to compose the character. You might want to draw, by building polygons, draw lines in some memory, and then fill them, and then build larger objects out of sets of smaller polygons. So how this might look is I can draw a couple of points in a space. I can draw a line between those two points in the Amiga. That's done in hardware. I can then draw another line by drawing two more points and a line in between. And then I can apply an operation to the whole thing and it will start propagating lines to fill in polygons. Back when they didn't exist. So, going a little farther, we have these pallet registers. If you use one bit, you could extend one of the three values. And this is, in retrospect, color compression. Um, let me show you an example of what it might look like. That's an Amiga display. Yep. That's ham. And another one, this game, if I can get it to work, I like flight simulators. I have a flight simulator, three of them actually, for this. And if I can get video to work, I can display that. But what happens is that is a non-animated painting that uses Hold and Modify to get all those shadow effects on the intercepting aircraft. <sighs> so
So it had, like I say, the VCS had a few Sprite engines, PCS had more, this one had eight of them, and they're reusable. So let me demonstrate a little bit about what that means. Let's suppose I have got one engine, this is only one, reusing a single engine. And each has 32-bit wide records. The first record says what vertical line it starts on and what vertical line it, horizontal line it starts on and then what line it stops on and there's some other control bits. So what follows the start record, which is 32 bits, is four color, I'm sorry, two bit plane, so it's four color, of what it's gonna look like. In this particular case, imagine they point at a palette register that's blue. So I could have then an oval shaped object drawn in memory. When it gets to the end, it's done. So I could have another bit plane record, which starts again with where it is, new horizontal start, new vertical start, how long it is, and another image, and another color. And after it's done, I can do a third one, and then a fourth one. The hardware in the Amiga could do a reasonable job of displaying NFL football with 11 players per team, a ball, and several referees scurrying around, and maybe some background stuff for where the yard lines are. The hardware can do that in a fairly straightforward fashion. I'm not planning to do that up here, but it could. For those of you who like football. But, suppose you like music. I had a chance to design this thing. I have not yet in my life been able to program this thing. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a reason for that, but I'm not there yet. It has four general purpose audio engines. Each one is scanning an 8-bit audio waveform. It is not a sound generator per se. It's sweeping an image to the speaker rather than an image to the screen. So it can the, each of the four engines can be pointed at a certain place in memory. It can be told at what rate it should be sampling that image. It can be told how long it's going to go sample before it stops. It can be a single, uh, single word, which is two 8-bit samples. That'll make you a square wave. And it can be 4,000 bytes long. So you can digitize an image and stick it in memory, and then it'll just play that and you can make it play it indefinitely. Um, there is separately an 8-bit multiplying D to A to determine what its volume is. The sum of all these is fed to either the TV modulator or to the local audio amplifiers. And at some point, I'm going to have time to play with this. I haven't had a time yet. I was just retired out of my last job a year ago this month. And I've spent most of the last year as a full-time caretaker for my wife who has cancer. That's ending on Monday. So, use cases. I can have four independent channels. I suppose I've got a four-player game. I can have a channel assigned to each one. I can have an audio channel be a sine wave or a triangle or a square wave. I can put a pseudo-random pad here in there if that's what I want. Um, I can record a musical image and play it back. I can, in fact, if I want to play, let's say, a major triad as the first, third, and fifth, I can take one image, superimpose it, add it to another image in regular editions, and add a third image, and add them all up and put them in one image that's 60, an example would be 60 bytes long, and that's, I, you know, I can make a major triad, I can do minor triads, I can do a seventh triad, I'm sorry, seventh chord, all those things, one channel per engine. 
So I could record a rhythm track and a bass track and a guitar track and digitize some voice and do an audio, you know, a singing track with one set of these things. That's a use case, I think. Unfortunately, I don't have any to play. One of the things that happened in the industry was a standard was developed that represents what Amigas can do, and that's become a common uh, standard for a lot of other sound systems. So that's what all the logic looked like. So I think I'm running a little bit out of time. Is it worth trying to start this? Let's give it a shot. I'm curious if we were, <laughs> if we were successful. So yeah. See it lighting up. Ah, there we go. And if this works, it's just going to be monochrome because it's RGB to composite. Oh. Meantime, I'll, while it's waking itself up, I'm going to talk about what happened. So, we first of all did this pivot. Commodore bought Amiga in 1984. This was after I, they ran out of money for me. Really? Yep. Because that window pops up immediately. Hello? There we are. Discover the magic cadence. while I'm talking. All right, so what I'm going to do is talk while I'm trying to wake this thing up. So the first pivot was Commodore bought Amiga and rescued them from Jack Tramiel in 1984. So they brought out their first, and meantime, the video game market was collapsing in 1983 and 1984 which is why Amiga had some funding problems. And as a result of all that, Amiga realized that they didn't think that they could invest in the video game market. They didn't foresee the success of Nintendo, which started in 1985, based on the Japanese Famicom that year. So they thought, well, okay, let's pivot to a personal computer. And they looked around and they saw the Mac announcement in. Super Bowl of 1984, they said, hey, it's got the same processor. It's got a windowed operating system. We should do that too. So a year later, they demonstrated a windowed operating system personal computer called the Amiga 1000. Um, hang on a second. <coughs> Since I can't show you the presentation yet. The only picture I've got. Ah! That is that live screen. We're going to set it in demo mode, number one. Yep, yep. And that will means it'll fly around chasing oh, yeah, me. Yeah. Okay. So, good. 
Here is what the Amiga 1000 looked like. It was demonstrated in 1985, shipped in <coughs> subsequent quantities in 1986. Um, so they pivoted to a personal computer. It was technically vastly much more advanced than the PCs of that time. It was multimedia and it was preemptive multitasking. The Apple operating system didn't get preemptive multitasking until the mid-1990s. Windows 3. Point, well, Windows 4.0, Windows NT4 was really preemptive multitasking. That came out in like 19... 96. <laughs> 96? Yeah. Yeah. This thing was substantially ahead of its competition. Now, this hasn't got the good color because it's monochrome, but while I'm talking, this is going to demonstrate the kind of stuff it can do. Do we have sound? Okay. No worries. Um, so we did. To, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're going to have to wrap this up. This panel's actually gone seven minutes over, and we need to set up for the next one. So if you could wrap this up, I don't want to. Well, we'll let the demo run and we'll show. stop it, and I'll try to take a couple of questions. The rest of production history was they came out with a simpler version next year and a more complicated version with lots of slots. That's what the uh, video toaster ran on. Um, they produced more and interesting hardware until, oh, early 90s when Amiga ran out of money and went out of business. And it's always been kind of a cult favorite machine, but not wildly popular. And can you see that it's how fast it's rendering? That was really unusual machines at that period. This is on a machine with a seven megahertz processor. Seven megahertz, right? All of you have, you know, your cell phones have things that are dual processor, four gigahertz processors in it. This was a seven megahertz doing all this stuff. Um, so Amiga became a cult favorite. I got to go meet a lot of these people a year ago when they had the Amiga 30 demonstration at the Computer History Museum last year and got to meet a lot of the people who worked on the software after I did. Meantime, last thing I want to show off, so many years later people re-implemented this hardware based on what they call a MIST platform, M-I-S-T. So this machine is a re-implementation of this in FPGA. So it's got USB ports on the back for more I.O. It has VGA on the back for more I.O. And instead of needing floppy drives or spinning disk hard drives, it needs SD. There's the audio. So it's going to finish fairly soon. So it has, I think, just shot down some fictitious Russian aircraft and is now going to fly under the Golden Gate Bridge and then it's going to land. So I'm going to let it run while I pack up everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions while I'm packing up? Yeah. Right. Right. And I'm going to take questions over on the other side by. Well, I'm going to go out because. Right. I'm supposed to go out and where people line up, right? Yep. I'm going to go there. Okay. Um, last thing, my original notebooks. All right. Thank you, everyone.